uh, uh. All right, everybody, I think we're gonna get started. So our presenter today is gonna be Dr. Ruben Valenzuela. So a little bit about Ruben. He was uh, born and raised in the Philippines. He finished his uh, neurology training at the University of Illinois. He's currently a fellow here in neuro-ophthalmology and he, um, he's actually one of my favorite fellows he's, because of his patience and his wi willingness to teach. But after he's done here, he's actually gonna go and do a second fellowship in multiple sclerosis, um, after which he's gonna, he has a job lined up at the University of Illinois uh, in the neurology department. So without further ado, here's Dr. Valenzuela. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna do a short uh, lecture on the neuroophthalmic uh, manifestations of uh, sarcoidosis. And so uh, we'll start with the case. So I have a 40-year-old um, Caucasian man who we saw in consultation in September because of blurred uh, vision in the left eye. And so uh, he, he was previously healthy. In, aug in August, he, aw uh, he awoke with painless uh, loss of vision in the left eye. And he described his vision as almost like a frosted glass appearance with like a fishnet over his left eye. And it was constant. And he, uh, he described uh, it was associated with uh, intermittent episodes of uh, transient visual obscuration that would happen at least four to five times per day. Although he denies any eye pain, he said that his left eye feels tired uh, all the time. So uh, he denies headache. He has no shortness of breath, no cough. He has very mild fatigue. And he has this rash in, in his anal area that's been going on for the last uh, three years. And he has a rash in his left knee that has uh, not been evaluated by his primary care physician or a dermatologist. And so on examination, his visual acuity was 20, uh, 15 in the right eye and 2050 minus 1 in the left. His pupils were symmetric with a 0 0.9 uh, log unit relative afferent pupillary defect in the left. His visual fields and <coughs> extraocular motilities are normal. Uh, his anterior segment examination is uh, normal, uh, specifically as no cells the anterior chamber. He has a two millimeter left proptosis. On dilated examination, his right optic nerve is normal, but he has a plus three disc uh, swelling in the left eye and some uh, retinal uh, striae in the left eye. His neurologic and physical examination you know, were otherwise unremarkable, except for this small uh, uh, rash in his left knee. So his MRI actually showed enhancement uh, proximal to the uh, left uh, optic nerve, and also there's evidence of obstruction of the CSF flow in the optic nerve sheet distal to the lesion. And you'll see there's minimal extension of the lesion into the optic uh, canal. The right optic nerve seem normal and there's no evidence of uh, tumor or metastasis elsewhere in the brain. And when you look at the coronal section, you'll see that the left optic nerve is also actually enlarged. <laughs> yes, sir. About the So uh, my, Im my impression is if you have uh, in in increased uh, flow of a C a CSF and increased pressure, it, the fluid would just go through the sides of the uh, nerve sheath uh, from pressure itself. And then we, al we also requested the CT of the orbit to check for any abnormal uh, calcification. And we didn't find any abnormal ca uh, calcification in the CT of the orbit. And we also requested the chest <coughs> x-ray specifically to look for um, any you know, pulmonary, pulmonary infiltrates or uh, by hyalur lymphadenopathies, but the chest x-ray was normal. And so uh, in summary, we have a 40-year-old Caucasian man with a painless loss of vision in the left eye in the setting of a left optic uh, neuropathy and severe swelling actually of the left uh, optic nerve. Uh, he had an abnormal MRI. And we, we gave him a trial of steroids and he was responsive to steroids. The visual actu uh, acuity actually improved in the left. And there was also some improvement of the left proptosis. And so for this particular patient, we considered the following differential diagnosis. So uh, we considered meningioma, uh, glioma, lymphoma, infectious and any you know, inflammatory condition, and autoimmune and demyelinating disease. Although the, the CT of the orbit did not show any abnormal calcification, we still considered meningioma in the differ differential diagnosis because only 30 to 40% of uh, patients with meningioma would show abnormal uh, cal calcification uh, in the uh, CT scan. And so uh, what do you want to do next for this uh, patient? Any suggestions? Uh, 
labs, imaging, observe. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we talked about the, the a number of differential diagnoses. So what specific what specific lab do you wanna get for this patient? Yeah, CBD, CRT, hmm. Very good. So all those were were requested. So so because of the high suspicion for you know infection and in, inflammatory process, we got a CBC and, and ESR, they were all uh, they were both normal. We also did an extensive infectious workup. So we, d we did a quantiferin TB, a test for syph uh, syphilis, a viral panel, they were all negative. Uh, liver enzymes were all within normal. Uh, serum angiotensin converting enzyme was within normal. I think it was nine. And then the, the only thing that came out positive was uh, an elevated serum lysozyme, 27 uh, nanograms per mil. I think the normal is, I think ab about 17. We also got a serum aquapoint four, four to rule out neuromyelitis optica. <laughs> He had the lumbar puncture and the CSF profile was normal. He had no cells, sugar and protein were both within normal. And so we did not really have, based on the labs and you know, the presentation of the patient, we really did not have a definitive diagnosis. So we considered there was a discussion about you know, getting an, op, an, op, uh, an orbital biopsy but because of the risk to his vision. We were kind of thinking of you know, getting a less invasive procedure. So we ended up getting a biopsy of his skin uh, lesion. So a skin punch biopsy of the left knee. Remember in his physical examination, there's this um, uh, skin rash in his left knee. So we got a, a skin punch biopsy that showed granuloma. And still with the granuloma, you have to consider other you know, inflammatory or infectious process, but the non-cascating uh, nature of the lesion made sarcoidosis a, a primary uh, diagnosis. And so this patient was diagnosed with um, ocular sarcoidosis without pulmonary involvement. And so sarcoidosis was first described by Dr. Jonathan uh, Hutchinson. He's a dermatologist, and he described this diffuse uh, raised red lesions in, in one of his patients, but he did not really use any term for this uh, lesion. In 1888, Dr. Ar uh, Ernest Besnier uh, coined the term lupus per uh, perineo to describe this raised uh, diffuse uh, skin lesions. And then in 1909, a Danish uh, ophthalmologist named Dr. Uh, I forgot his name, uh, Christensen, described a triad of symptoms uh, consisting of uh, fever, uh, parotitis, and uh, uveitis. And uh, from then on, you know, they, they were describing a condition called uh, sarcoidosis. But in 1915, Dr. Uh, Shulman actually emphasized that sarcoidosis a, is a systemic condition. And so he made a lot of research on this uh, disease and because of all his um, uh, work on describing this condition, pathologists described this um, calcification and this protein deposits in the Langhans giant cells as uh, shaman or asteroid uh, bodies. In 1937, uh, uh, uveroparotid uh, fever was pr first described. And then the first international conference on uh, sarcoidosis was held in London. And interestingly, we had the first uh, convention on sarcoidosis in Washington, D.C. in 1961. And so sarcoidosis usually occurs in the third or fourth uh, decades of life, and the prevalence is estimated at around 10 to 40 per uh, 100,000. But the incidence is actually higher in African Americans, at least 10 to 17 times higher. And in Caucasians, around 15 uh, to 20 per, per 100,000. Uh, it's sporadic, and there's no gender predominance, although ocular sarcoidosis is more commonly seen in women. And then uh, the etiology is unknown, so it's largely a diagnosis of uh, exclusion. A lot of studies were done on genetic and environmental factors, but it revealed really little about you know, sarcoidosis. But currently there are studies on uh, association between HLA-DRB1 uh, and mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA uh, in relation to sarcoidosis. So histologically, they would present with uh, non-cascating uh, granulomas in the affected tissue with some asteroid and uh, Schumann uh, bodies. And so half of the patients with sarcoidosis would uh, be asymptomatic, and the rest would present with different symptoms. And the most common would be respiratory symptoms. So some patients would present with cough, shortness of breath, and some would have skin lesions as uh, my patient. 
and skin lesions would vary from you know having like almost like an erythema, uh, nodosum, uh, uh, lupus perineal scars or plaques, and then lacrimal and uh, salivary gland uh, involvement is relatively common. And then I'm just going to point out that ocular sarcoidosis is very common uh, presentation. It's found in 30 to 50 percent <coughs> of patients with sarcoidosis, and in fact, it's more common than neurosarcoidosis, around 10 to 15 percent. And in fact, some uh, literatures uh, reported only 5 percent of uh, neurosarcoidosis. Um, the mo uh, 90 percent of patients with uh, sarcoidosis would have pulmonary involvement. And so a very important test would be getting a chest x-ray or chest CT. And there's a pulmonary staging for uh, sarcoidosis if there's pulmonary involvement, of course. And so the staging are based on uh, four you know, different stages. So stage one would be bihilar uh, lymphadenopathies and chest x-ray. And 67% of these uh, patients with bihilar lymphadenopathies would have spontaneous resolution of symptoms uh, within one to two years. And then stage two are patients who present with uh, uh, reticular nodular in, in infiltrates. Around 46% of patients would have a spontaneous resolution of symptoms within one to two years. And then stage three are patients with uh, pulmonary infiltrates. And unfortunately, less than 10%, around 10% would have resolution of symptoms in two years. And then of course, the worst would be patients presenting with fibrocystic changes and bullous changes in the chest x-ray. Um, as you can see in this table, so uh, sarcoidosis, sarcoidosis would be basically s systemic manifestations of, you know, different organs can be involved. If you note, the cardiac um, involvement is very rare, is five or less than, less than five percent, but it's the most clinically challenging and the most fatal involvement uh, in sarcoidosis. And so, again, I would mention that it's very common ocular involvement is 30 to 50 percent versus 10 to 50 percent in neurosarcoidosis. So what are the uh, neuroophthalmic manifestations of sarcoidosis? So you can have um, anterior uveitis, and in fact, it's the most common ophthalmic manifestation of um, an ocular sarcoidosis. So 40 to 70 percent of patients would present with anterior uveitis, and 80 percent of the time, it's bilateral involvement. And uh, typically, they would present with acute iritis or uh, iridocyclitis. And then posterior uveitis would be seen in 14 to 20 percent of patients. And uh, with posterior uveitis, it's very common to have cystoid uh, uh, macular uh, edema. And then the other presentation would be orbital sarcoid. You can have involvement of the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, or the posterior chias uh, chiasmal visual pathway. And um, oculomotor dysfunction and pupillary dysfunction have been reported in the literature, but not uh, very common. And so the signs in anterior uveitis can, uh, can, can be, uh, you know, uh, mutton fat, keratic precipitates. You have uh, capi nodules, you have uh, bosaka nodules, you have anterior chamber or uh, ciliary uh, body inflammation. And so, so this is an example of your um, uh, mutton fat, keratic precipitates. So these are inflammatory cells that are found in the corneal endothelium. And, um, most of, the, most of the time, it's associated with uh, granulomatous inflammation, and it's highly suggestive of uh, sarcoidosis. And then you can have uh, capi nodules that are usually seen along the, the pupillary margins. And uh, it's when you have uh, capi nodules, uh, it can be anidus for posterior synechae, and there's a risk for developing you know, cataract, glaucoma, and band keratopathy. Um, and then you can also find uh, bosaka nodules like closer to the limbus, uh, these brown arrows. And then uh, mutton fat keratic precipitates are this, you know, whitish <coughs> nodules right here, the corneal endothelium. And then in posterior uveitis, the signs would be from inflammation, obviously inflammation of your vitreous, your retina, and your choroid. And then the common signs would be your, your candle wax drippings. You can have branch retinal vein occlusions. You can have uh, neovascularization and hemorrhage, you can have vasculitis, you can have chorioretinal granulomas. So this uh, patient uh, presented with chorio choroidal uh, vasculitis as evidenced by the white uh, subretinal spots. So this particular patient pr uh, presented with cells in the anterior chamber in the vitreous. And so another uh, sign in uh, posterior uveitis would be candle wax drippings. So this would be your whitish and sometimes yellowish white 
uh, waxy retinal uh, precipitates that are found along the retinal veins, usually in the inferior equatorial retina and sometimes in the posterior poles of your retina. And um, some literature suggests that 20 to 40 percent of patients with sarcoidosis would present with uh, candle wax uh, drippings. And histopathologically, candle wax drippings are actually uh, represent periphlebitis and uh, uh, chorioretinal granuloma. So sometimes the candle wax drippings are called uh, granulomatous periphlebitis. And then you can, uh, this patient obviously had a branch uh, retinal vein occlusion it's from uh, ocular sarcoidosis. You see this uh, interretinal, <coughs> segmental interretinal hemorrhage. And then you can also have retinal vascular sheathing, as you can see in this uh, colored fundus photo in this uh, uh, angiogram. And then uh, patients can have chorioretinal granulomas. This can be associated with your candle, uh, candle wax drippings as well. So these are whitish uh, uh, lesions, and they appear in clusters. So whitish lesions are usually associated with more active disease. And then more chronic disease usually present with like grayish uh, appearance of the lesions with sharp margins. So they could be chronic or you know cicatricial uh, lesions. And so um, they can also have retinal macroaneurysms as you can see in this uh, fundus fo photo and the intermediate and late stage of your uh, fluorescein angiogram. But I think what's interesting is when they took an ICGA of this patient, it showed hypofluorescent areas that actually uh, they said that were associated with occult uh, granulomas. And so I think ICGA is very important, especially in patients that present with very minimal ocular signs and you want to prove that there's bilateral involvement, so ICGA is a good test. <coughs> and so although not, not specific, you can see neovascularization and hemorrhage with uh, ocular uh, sarcoidosis. And so uh, orbital sy uh, sarcoid, the most common uh, manifestation would be involvement of your lacrimal glands. <coughs> and sometimes patients can also have uh, tumors that appear in the eyelid, so they can have eyelid mass. And then the signs and symptoms can, can mimic an orbital tumor, so they can have optic neuropathy, they can have diplopia, uh, exophthalmos and proptosis, and signs of dry eyes. And this is an axial MRI showing uh, bilateral uh, lacrimal gland involvement in a patient with uh, lac lacrimal sar sarcoidosis. So uh, symmetric involvement of the lacrimal glands have been reported to be highly suggestive of ocular, sarco uh, ocular sarcoidosis, but you have to rule out other causes of bilateral lacrimal gland involvement. And you, know, you have to make sure that you rule out lymphoma, leukemia, and infection. <coughs> and one literature suggests that a, a good way of differentiating um, sarcoid from lymphoma with in your imaging is getting a, dis a DWI, diffusion weighted imaging and ADC. And apparently a lymphoma would have lower DWI and ADC compared to your, sar to, to com compared to your sarcoidosis. And then um, there are certain imaging findings that can help you say whether this is lacrimal involvement in sarcoid. So usually they describe lacrimal involvement as diffuse smooth, homogeneous involvement and almost symmetric involvement of the, the lacrimal glands. Um, and just, you know, ad additional information, lacrimal glands thickness normally measure around four millimeters. In this particular patient is at full thickness, it's around 11 millimeters. So this patient was diagnosed with uh, lacrimal gland uh, sarcoidosis. So another example that would be uh, sarcoidosis involving the lower lid uh, margins. Um, optic nervous involvement is very rare, but when they do happen, they can present with varying degrees of visual field defect and relative afferent papillary defect. And they can present with papilledema. They can present with anterior or posterior optic neuropathy, optic atrophy, or disc elevation. And so this particular patient has the, this small uh, nodule in the disc that resulted in disc elevation. And kind of dramatic, uh, elevation of the disc in someone with sarcoid uh, papillitis. Optic chiasm involvement, again, is a rare uh, presentation in sarcoidosis, but uh, when they happen, it's very difficult to differentiate from your pituitary tumor because they present similarly with patients with a pituitary mic microadenoma or macroadenoma for that 
purpose. So they can have uh, diabetes insipidus, they can have aminuria, galacteria, hypogonadism, or bitemporal hemianopia. So uh, this T1 uh, post contrast sagittal and coronal section shows enhancement of the optic chiasm. So this, uh, this was a, a pediatric patient who was initially misdiagnosed with optic chiasm glioma and ended up <coughs> having optic chiasm sarcoidosis. He responded really well with uh, steroids. And the involvement of the posterior uh, chiasmal visual pathway can be symptomatic based on three different mechanisms. So they can have compressive effect, they can infiltrate, and they can have vascular changes. And sometimes they can have stroke-like uh, lesions or stroke-like symptoms from angitis and from uh, thrombosis. And then you can have oculomotor dysfunction. Basically, the most common would be isolated sixth nerve function. Involvement of the third nerve is very not very common. And if you have a gaze palsy, make sure you rule out supranuclear gaze palsy from neurosarcoidosis. So pupillary, uh, pupillary dysfunction, they can present you know, differently as severe as loss of vision or some change, just minor changes in your pupil. For instance, you can have parasympathetic denervation and you can have ton a tonic pupil. Sympathetic denervation, you can have Horner syndrome and, and you can also have Argyll Robertson uh, pupil. And uh, sometimes patients would come to you with Bell's palsy because cranial facial nerve is the most common uh, cranial nerve involved in uh, sarcoidosis. And the second most common is your optic nerve. However, of course, patient can present with multiple cranial neuropathies. And so because ocular sarcoidosis is very common, so the International Workshop on Ocular Sarcoidosis actually developed a diagnostic criteria for ocular sarcoidosis. And so it's universally accepted that the to have a definitive diagnosis, you have a positive biopsy. But some patients would not agree to have, you know, intraocular biopsy because of risk to their vision. So the International Works Workshop on Sarcoidosis developed um, diagnostic criteria that may or may not involve biopsy findings based on seven ocular signs and five laboratory tests. Okay, so the five, uh, the seven ocular signs are the signs that we discuss in anterior uveitis. So patients can have uh, mutton fat, keratic precipitates, kepi or uh, busaca nodules, uh, trabecular meshwork nodules. They can have string of uh, pearls, vitreous opacities. They can have um, multiple uh, chorioretinal lesions. You can have uh, candle wax drippings, optic disc nodules, and very important would be bilateral involvement uh, with, with sarcoidosis. And then the five uh, laboratory tests would be very important check for TB, check for a, a serum angiotensin converting enzyme and or a serum lysozyme, check for chest x-ray if chest x-ray is negative do a chest CT and then check for liver enzymes. And so um, it, this is not part of the diagnostic criteria but I just want to make sure that when you work up a patient you rule out all the masquerades or the mimickers of sarcoidosis so make sure you rule out TB, ocular TB, lymphoma, virus of, uh, vi viral infections. <coughs> I forgot to add here uh, syphilis as well. You need to check those. Autoimmune and demyelinating disease. Uh, Volk Koyanaga Harada, Harada syndrome. Not very common, but sometimes can present like sarcoidosis. And so uh, serum angiotensin converting enzyme alone has 73% sensitivity and 83% specificity. It's a very good test to monitor uh, disease activity. So an higher uh, ACE levels are usually associated with more active disease. And then 58 to 60 percent of biopsy proven cases of elevated angiotensin converting enzyme. But when I was doing my research on this topic, it was kind of kind of interesting to note that they're saying that angiotensin converting enzyme is not re really very useful in two uh, sets of populations. So children can have elevated angiotensin converting enzyme above the normal values. And then watch out for pati hypertensive patients on ACE inhibitors, you know, patients on lisinopril. So patients on ACE inhibitors can have undetectable levels of angiotensin converting enzymes despite having, you know, raging sarcoidosis. And so for this, this two uh, population of patients, the solution they said is get a serum lysozyme. Although it's not a sensitive or as specific as, uh, as your serum ACE, 
it has 60% sensitivity and 70% specificity. In our patient, he was not on you know, any ACE inhibitor. ACE, apparent, uh, unfortunately, was negative within normal, but the lysozyme was elevated. And then, uh, since granulomas can form in the liver, you want to make sure that you check your liver enzymes. So check for alkaline phosphatase, check for AST and ALT. To be considered significant, your alkaline phosphatase should be at least three times above the normal value, and your AST and ALT should be twice above the normal value. And so, again, check for TB, very important. So I would prefer you do a quantifier and TB goal. So, for example, never ever do a tuberculin skin test in a patient like me who came from a third world who has a BCG because there will be a lot of, you know, maybe difficulty in interpretation depending on who's, who's reading your skin test. So quantifier and TB gold is simple, it's easy, and it's very easy to interpret. So go with quantifier and TB gold. And then chest x-ray, at least 50% of patients would have pulmonary involvement. So always get a chest x-ray. If chest x-ray is negative, go ahead and get your CT of the chest. And then, uh, and then based on the seven ocular signs and five tests, there are four levels of diagnostic certainty based on the sarcoidosis. So you have a definite sarcoidosis if it's biopsy proven, whether it's a skin biopsy, a transbronchial lung biopsy, a lacrimal gland biopsy, and then you consider the ocular symptoms. So it's a presumed sarcoidosis if you have adenopathies and ocular signs. If for, a, for any reason you don't have the bicellular adenopathies, you need three signs and two positive blood tests. And so it's possible you need four signs, four ocular signs, and three lab tests. Um, so this is, a, this is a diagram I got from the International Workshop on Sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is, has a very uh, high incidence. So they start with a very invasive and aggressive procedure. So they do transbronchial lung biopsy. And depending on the result, they go with the less invasive procedure to diagnose patients. So I think <coughs> the way to go is being you know, practical and n being non-invasive. So if you have ocular signs and symptoms, you do your chest. you decide on whether you want to do a biopsy. And the biopsy would be any of the following. You can do skin, you can do a lymph node, salivary and lacrimal gland biopsy, and then um, conjunctival and trans lung, uh, transbronchial lung biopsy. So it's, it's a blind procedure, so you can have false negative results depending on you know which area you biopsy. But it's interesting to know that just like Algerian and then Bausch is actually one of the diagnostic criteria is used by the Japanese Society of Sarcoidosis. And so they stain the fluid and they look, look at the pathology. And in the addition, they look at the, the T lymphocytes, the T, T cell count, and an elevated CD4 and CD8 level is actually suggestive of sarcoidosis. And so uh, I'm gonna go back to the ICGA because I think some clinics underuse uh, ICGA in diagnosing uh, sarcoidosis. So for, some, for a patient who, ha who has signs of anterior uveitis, signs and symptoms of anterior uveitis, but very limited ocular signs of sarcoidosis, ICGA is a very good test to show the clinical picture and the diagnosis of the patient because it confirms the bilateral, bilateral variety of the disease. And then it also detects ocular uh, lesions. And then they mentioned four ICGA for sarcoidosis, although I think it's non-specific. So you look at uh, hypofluorescent dark spots, and then there's fuzziness of the large choroidal vessels, and then there's late diffuse choroidal hyperfluorescence, and then they said very common, you see hyperfluorescent pinpoints in a patient with ocular sarcoidosis. And so management of this, yes. Both anterior and posterior. 
Uh, so for management, majority of the patients, 75% would require symptomatic treatment with or without uh, steroids. But then for patients with widespread, uh, widespread disease, corticosteroids is the mainstay of treatment. So one literature I reviewed mentioned using methylprednisolone at 20 milligrams per kilogram per day for three to five days followed by prednisone taper. And then uh, for patients who are, who are unresponsive to steroids or who, the, who cannot tolerate steroids, you can consider uh, steroid sparing agents. So the most uh, studied drug, uh, non -sparing a non a steroid sparing agent for sarcoid is methotrexate. So there's a lot of uh, pulmonary and hepatic uh, toxicity around, I would say 10 to 20%. So they uh, recommend, of, of course, using folic acid when you treat patients uh, with methotrexate. And then another drug would be azathioprine. So those bone marrow suppression with azathioprine. So one of the complications would be malignancy. But the most common uh, side effect would be thrombocytopenia and elevated liver enzymes. There's some report of uh, success in using mycophenolate with uh, UVL sarcoidosis, neurosarcoidosis, even neurosarcoidosis. But I think what's commonly used now as a replacement for And so, in general, uh, the patients can have, uh, the disease can remit spontaneously, but in some patients, you can have uh, exacerbations and remissions. And uh, the, the prognosis is less favorable in African Americans. And with cardiac involvement, it's really a bad prognosis. For patients who have a chronic course, the following can happen. They they can have cancer in other uh, areas that are affected by the sarcoidosis. There's a risk for lymphoma, and there's a risk for lymphoproliferative uh, disorder like a non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. And so uh, for this uh, particular patient, so this patient received uh, methyl uh, prednisolone and uh, prednisone uh, taper. Um, his vision actually improved from 2050 to 2020, and the proptosis actually you know, improve as well. So he's being followed by pulmono uh, pulmonology and rheumatology, and so far he's been happy. I didn't ask about the anal lesion, but he's happy with all what's going on with you know his life right now. Overall, much improved. Um, those are my references. Thank you.